Yes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope that I'm audible. If not, you know, you can just um, give an indication. Yeah, OK, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, yes. So um, today we will be looking at Psalms and Proverbs. Uh, we started the wisdom books last week. Uh, we started off with the book of Job. Uh, and today we will look at Psalms and Proverbs very briefly. Uh, just so that we will have uh, an idea of what these two books talk about. Um, the Psalms, as we know, uh, uh, that book covers a total of 150 individual Psalms written by a variety of authors. Uh, for instance, there is a one Psalm written by Moses. You know, So that would be the earliest Psalm that was written, and that is Psalm 90. Uh, there are a couple of psalms written by Solomon, uh, Psalm 72 and Psalm 127. Uh, the sons of Korah, they have written uh, 12 psalms. Uh, David has, in fact, uh, written 73 psalms. So it's only 47 psalms which do not have a superscript um, explaining to us uh, you know, who the writer of the psalm is. So there are 47 anonymous psalms. Uh, but apart from that, the rest of the Psalms uh, are attributed to one author or the other. Uh, so uh, this wide variety of Psalms uh, were written over a long period of time, all the, all the way from the time of Moses. Um, some were, uh, were written after the, you know, the Israelites came back from exile. Uh, that would be Psalm 107. An example of that would be Psalm 107 which was written after the um, people came back from exile. So um, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, there would have been people uh, appointed by God who would have brought all these Psalms together and arranged them in a, a particular manner as led by the Lord. Uh, so this probably would have taken place during the time of Ezra or maybe a little beyond, uh, you know, a little after Ezra's time, uh, when um, those who have been inspired by the Holy Spirit would have gathered these Psalms uh, in a particular order, you know, so that the final format of the book of Psalms would have taken shape either during the time of Ezra or shortly after that. Uh, so when we look at the way these Psalms have been arranged, uh, we see that Psalms 1 and 2 are forming a kind of introduction. Um, and uh, the, these 150 Psalms have been divided into five sections. Um, so if you were to look in your Bibles, you know, you would see it will say uh, book 1 or section 1. Uh, so um, Psalms 1 to 41 uh, are part of section 1. And then uh, Psalm 42 onwards up to Psalm 72 uh, will be section 2 or book 2. So in that way, uh, those who were inspired by the Holy Spirit to compile this, these Psalms in a particular order, they chose to, um, to compile the Psalms into five uh, books or sections. And each seems to have one main focus. So um, Psalms 1 and 2, like I said, are the introduction. Uh, so in Psalm 1, um, we are introduced to two categories of people, uh, the ones who are righteous, uh, the ones who are faithfully following the ways of Yahweh. And you have the unrighteous or the wicked. And um, they have no blessings upon them. So. At the very beginning of the Psalms, in the very first Psalm, we are introduced to these two categories of people. And throughout the 150 Psalms, you see these two types of people being referred to. There are those who are under the covering of God because they have chosen to be faithful to him and to his covenant. And then there are the wicked who are not under the covering of God. So they may prosper for a while, but ultimately, the judgment of God will catch up with them. Uh, so um, when we go to Psalm 2, that tells us what will be the ultimate destiny of these 
blessed people you know the ones who have chosen to uh, stay faithful to the lord it talks about the messiah who will one day establish his rule on the earth and um, so when uh, the blessed come into that kingdom into the into that future kingdom their eternity their eternal future will be completely made secure so right at the outset in the introduction you have these two psalms psalm 1 uh, which talks about these two categories of people and psalm 2 which tells us what will be the ultimate destiny of uh, these two categories of people the unrighteous will will face judgment on the other hand the blessed ones the ones who have stayed faithful um, they will enjoy uh, you know um, uh, uh, eternity in the presence of the messianic king so which is why when you look at psalm 1 and 2 uh, you know this introduction you will see there's a resemblance between the first verse psalm 11 and the last verse of this introduction which will be psalm chapter 2 verse 12 which is the last verse so uh, look at the similarity in the wording uh, psalm 11 it says blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked and then if you if you look at the last verse of psalm 2 it uh, psalm 2 verse 12 it says blessed are all who take refuge in him so the introduction is telling us who are the blessed ones the ones who choose to follow yahweh the ones who stay uh, you know uh, who, who stay in step with the ways of the lord they are the ones who will be blessed and they are the ones who will uh, you know take their refuge in him and uh, receive his protection and his provision and his care uh, so uh, having set this introduction for us from there uh, you know the uh, the the book moves into various other uh, psalms so in psalm 1 to 41 the main focus is about god who is with us so those who are faithful to to his covenant they those who walk in his ways they will always find that god is with them okay so uh, section 1 psalms 1 to 41 they focus on how god is with us in fact we see that in the very first psalm you know psalm 1 uh, if we look at uh verses 1 to 3 so um i mean as i am doing this uh, you know session uh, from my place and not from the bible college because uh, you know i had some transportation issues uh so if someone online uh, could read out for us uh, the first three verses of psalm 1 psalm 1 verses 1 to 3 please if you could read out uh, aloud for us any volunteers Psalm one verses one to three. To blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and he. in his law he meditates day and night he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season whose leaf also shall not wither and whatever he does shall prosper now uh, it's describing the people who choose to stay faithful to the covenant of the lord and it says these are not people who are walking in step with the wicked rather they choose to walk in step with yahweh so rather than delighting in wickedness and in crookedness these people are delighting in the law of the lord and what are these people like they are like people who are right next to, uh, you know who, they are like a tree which is right next to the streams of water so in the same way that tree is always next to the streams of water these faithful people of god are always next to the presence of god you know his living uh, presence uh, which over here is symbolized through streams of water so what what's the you know fate what is the destiny of a tree which is right next to the streams of water 
that tree will always bear fruit you know when the season for fruit bearing comes without fail it will bear fruit because it is sitting right next to the streams of water and that is the imagery which is given for the people who are faithful to the covenant of god they will always be right next to him god is with them he is beside them and therefore when the season comes for fruit bearing they will bear fruit you know as people we go through um, different seasons of life there are seasons of hardship there are seasons when god is silent there are seasons of training when god is working on us and refining us there are seasons of learning uh, where uh, he is teaching us new skills and it takes takes time for us to develop ourselves you know in those skills and and become experienced so there are different uh, seasons that we go through and so in some of those seasons you know we are, because we are still in the process of being refined we are still in the process of learning um, we may not bear fruit but there will come seasons which are the fruit bearing seasons and so at that time without fail we will be highly fruitful in all that we take up because we have been prepared by the gardener and now we are ready and we are right beside the streams of water we are right next to him he is with us and so we will definitely prosper and therefore it says that whatever these blessed people do it will prosper uh, so um here the emphasis in the psalm is about how god is with the righteous he is with the faithful so you know if you were to just go through these 41 psalms um you will you will see various examples of how god um shows his presence uh, you know his very close intimate presence with the righteous in um, in these 41 psalms so so um yeah, if, uh, Julian, I could mute um how do i mute let me see oh, yeah it's muted thank you yeah all right huh so okay that is section one psalms 1 to 41 moving into section two that will be psalms 42 to 72 so while in the first section the emphasis was on god with us in section two the emphasis is more on how god is god goes before us okay so god is not only with us god also goes before us and clears the way he fights the battles for us he he um he puts in place the things which we would require uh, for our uh, future actions uh, for our future um, you know um, assignments which we would need to fulfill so the in the in the second section psalms 42 to 72 the emphasis is on god going before us we will just look at one uh, one one or two examples um the first two was uh, chap uh, the first two psalms in this particular section you know psalm 42 and psalm 43 uh, they talk about how um, the psalmist is under attack from enemies he is under attack from different types of trials and troubles so in that instance um, his soul is rather disturbed and downcast so in both psalm 42 and psalm 43 there's this uh, verse which is repeated it's exactly the same wording both in psalm 42 11 and also psalm 43 5. now if we could have someone read out for us uh, one of them uh, maybe we could read out psalm 42 verse 11 if we could have one person read out psalm 42 verse 11 please why are thou cast down oh my soul and why art thou discreted within me? Hope, hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the heart of my countenance and my God. Yes, and the same verse is again repeated in Psalm 43, 5. So when we are under attack, 
uh, either from enemies or from trials and tribulations at that time you know the soul who we are as a person that is downcast we feel discouraged we feel low um in fact uh, our soul may be very disturbed within us you know there are so many thoughts going through our mind and we are wondering from where the solution will come we are asking ourselves how to handle the crisis that we are in so in the midst of all of this the psalmist says to his soul put your hope in god for i will yet praise him yes right now things are not going well but i will yet praise him why because this is my savior and my god he is the one who will go before me he will clear the way he will straighten the crooked paths you know he will um, prepare everything that is required for my next assignment so he is the one who goes before me so in this section you know if you were to do, do a study of the psalms from 42 up to 72 you would see various examples of how God goes before his people and clears the way for them, how he fights their battles for them. So some, uh, so section one, the emphasis was on God with us. Section two, the emphasis is on God going before us. Coming to section three, that would be Psalms 73 up to 89. And here, in these psalms there's a lot of uh, focus on the punishment which god you know uh, brought upon the israelites uh, because of their sinfulness almost this entire section dwells upon the punishment of god uh, psalms 73 up to 89 but one thing that we see in these psalms even in the middle of punishment even in the middle of you know god's anger and wrath and judgment upon his people there is still hope he is still there um, you know surrounding them around them so in the section 3 the focus is on how god is around them surrounding them even though he is angry with them and he's, he has brought judgment and punishment upon them so there's hope for the people of God, even when correction is going on. There's hope for the people of God, even when he's disciplining them. Uh, uh, so to look at one example of that, uh, Psalm 89, verses 30 to 33. If we could have someone read out for us, Psalm 89, verses 30 to 33, please. If his children forsake my law and do not walk according to my rules, if they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the Lord and their iniquity with the stripes. But I will not remove from him my steadfast love or be forced to my faithfulness. So here, you know, this is just one example. And you, and you see many such examples in this section where God talks about his anger. Um, God talks about, uh, you know, the judgment he's bringing upon them. But even in the midst of all of this judgment, one thing that the Lord says is, I will not take my love from him. And here over here, the hymn is referring to, you know, his people, his chosen ones. And he says, and uh, nor will I ever betray my faithfulness. So therefore, you know, in, in light of this promise which God has made to his people in, uh, in, in, the, in the latter verses 49 and 50, you know, the psalmist talks to the Lord and he says, Lord, where is your former great love which in your faithfulness you swore to David? Remember, Lord, how your servant has been mocked how I bear in my heart the taunts of all the nations. So the psalmist reminds the Lord of this promise which he has made to his people that, you know, he will never betray his faithfulness, that he will never take away his love permanently from his people. And so uh, the psalmist appeals to the Lord and says, Lord, remember what you have promised uh, your people. 
So remember us in our time of trouble and fulfill what you have promised. So just like the psalmist over here, we too, when we have done some wrong, uh, when we have sinned against him and he is bringing correction and discipline upon us, yes, uh, it is a time of, um, uh, of pain because, you know, uh, we have repented and now we may be undergoing the consequences of our foolish actions. Uh, so it is a time of difficulty, but even in the midst of this time of discipline, in this section, we will find so many Psalms where, you know, the, the wording talks about um, how the Lord will still be faithful. And the, in so many places, you see the Psalmist crying out to God and saying, Lord, it's true that we have done this. But, oh, Lord, will you kindly remember your great faithfulness? You know, will you save us? Will you deliver us? So just like the Psalmist in these Psalms, we too can cry out to the Lord and ask for his mercy, ask for his deliverance, even when we are facing a time of disciplining and punishment. So um, section one, the focus was on God with us. Section two, the focus was on God going before us. And section three is, uh, is the assurance that God is still there, you know, surrounding us. Uh, he's, uh, you know, in, uh, wrapping us in his arms even in the time of correction and discipline, even at that time, we can expect uh, him to remain faithful to us. We can cry out to him and ask him to deliver us. Section four, uh, that would be Psalms 90 to 106. Now, in these Psalms, uh, the focus is more on the sovereignty of God, how God is above us. So up to now, we looked at God being with us, God going before us, God uh, also being around us. And now in this section four, um, the focus is on how God is above us. He's sovereign. He's in control. Uh, what he wants will be done. You know, uh, people can scheme and strategize against the purposes of God, but ultimately his purposes will prevail. So the assurance that there is for the people who, you know, who are under his protection, the assurance is that no matter what the enemy may try to devise against the people of God, God is above all and he is sovereign. So his purposes will ultimately prevail. So that's this deep assurance that we can have um, in this section. So there are many Psalms we, that we see in this particular section which focus on his sovereignty his complete and absolute control of all events. And because of his sovereignty, the protection which we have, you know, under his covering. Psalm 95 actually brings out that very beautifully. Um, so if we could uh, look at this uh, example of Psalm 95, verses 6 to 9. Psalm 95, 6 to 9, please. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. When your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they saw my work. So, you know, here... Uh, the right attitude that we should have to this God who is above us, you know, that, that right attitude is, is explained. Um, the psalmist says, come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. He is our maker. He is in control. So let us worship him. Let us kneel down and submit to him because, uh, you know, we are under his care. We are the people of his pasture. If we kneel down in submission and reverence, he will take care of his sheep. So let us be like people who, if we are hearing his voice, let us immediately respond. If he is correcting us, let us immediately repent, uh, rather than hardening our hearts like the Israelites did at Meribah and at Massah. So that is the essence that is being brought out in these verses. 
so because god is above us and because god is fully in control if we his sheep can just submit to him in reverence and obedience then he will take care of his flock you know he will never he will never allow the the flock of his pasture uh, to starve or to lack or to uh, or to be destroyed he will always be there as a shepherd to guide and protect so here the psalmist urges us to hear his voice and be uh, very quick in responding to whatever he is asking of us rather than hardening our hearts because that is the right attitude that we should have towards the sovereignty of god so in section 4 there are many psalms included which talk about how god is sovereign how god is um, you know um, in authority and um, nobody can get away with any scheme you know without his permission so we are safe under his protection and then from there we move into uh, section 5 uh, section 5 would be psalms 107 to 150 now um, in these psalms um, the main theme is one of praise and rejoicing almost all of these psalms are you know uh, regarding praise and worship um so here uh, the psalmist calls out to the people to rejoice because the lord is among us okay so in section 5 the emphasis is on how god is among us and therefore we should be rejoicing and um, um many of these psalms have beautiful themes of worship and praise uh, but my favorite is actually psalm 107 uh, because it talks about um it it's actually a psalm which was written to the people you know who had just come back from exile and um, when they come back to jerusalem um, the jerusalem is, is is in a broken down state and there's a lot of opposition from the locals you know we talked about that when we were covering ezra and nehemiah so in the midst of that kind of a setting the psalmist writes uh, you know about four categories of persons and how even they can rejoice in spite of their situations so in psalm 107 it calls upon four categories of people to praise god even though they are going through negative situations who are the four categories of persons in psalm 107 you have the wanderers the wanderers are those who know who are thirsty who are hungry longing for satisfaction they have been deprived of so much in life you know this they, they they their needs have been left unmet for in so many ways and they are longing and aching for something more so they are called upon to to rejoice and worship and praise the second category is the prisoners of sin they to uh, are called called upon to rejoice because god is going to set them free the third category are the fools and the rebels who deliberately chose evil rather than choosing righteousness and as a result of that you know they have suffered the consequences of that and it talks about how god brings healing to them so they too can rejoice and you have the fourth category they are the ones who have who are drowning in the storms of life um they are the people who have been overwhelmed by circumstances and they don't know what to do they are at their wits end and uh, such people you know he brings them out of their distress so let's look at a uh, uh, one or two verses uh, which refer to each of these four categories and uh, why they should they too can choose to rejoice in god why they too can respond with praise so we'll first start off with the wanderers the ones who are who are you know hungry and thirsty and longing for satisfaction what do the scriptures have to offer them you know what does the psalm have to say to them psalm 107 verses 8 and 9 psalm 107 8 and 9 uh, what does it say to the ones who are thirsty and starving yeah, oh that may we we'll praise the lord for his goodness and for his wonderful work to the to the children of men for he satisfied the longing soul 
and filled the hungry soul with goodness. Yeah. So why should we be thanking the Lord? You know, these people who are so unsatisfied. Why should they praise the Lord? Because it says the Lord is unfailing in his love. And it says his deeds are wonderful. So what is he going to do in his unfailing love and, and, his, I know, and in the wonder of his deeds? He is going to satisfy the thirsty. He is going to fill the hungry with good things. So if you are at a, at, a, um, at a stage in life where you know you have not received the things that you have been waiting for, you can cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, I am like these wanderers. But Lord, you said that you are unfailing in your love. You, you said that you are wonderful in your deeds. Therefore, oh Lord, just as you have promised in these verses, I cry out to you and I ask you that you would satisfy my thirst and fill my hunger with good things. So, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a promise that you can place before the Lord and say, Lord, I wish to claim this from you. So fulfill this in my life. And so you too can rejoice because the Lord will, you know, do this for you. The second category that we talked about, the prisoners of sin, who, because uh, they went deeper and deeper into sin, now uh, it's like as if this that particular sin or that particular temptation has bound them in its shackles. They're not able to break free anymore. They are now too deep into that particular sin, you know, where now they have become its prisoner. So such people, why are they being called upon to thank the Lord and rejoice? Uh, that would be covered in Psalm 107, verses 15 and 16. So if someone could read out for us Psalm 107, 15 and 16. Please, if we could have any volunteers. Oh, Someone. That men, oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works for the children of men. For he has broken the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron into two. Exactly. So even if a prisoner of sin is bound by uh, gates, you know, it is shut behind gates of bronze, and if they have been... Uh, uh, you know, bound by bars of iron, it, it says God will break through even those gates and he will set them free. So even the deepest prisoners of sin can be set free from their strongholds. That's the promise that God makes. And then the third category, the fools and the rebels who deliberately in their foolishness chose unrighteousness rather than the goodness of God. It says in Psalm 107, verse 20, he sent out his word and healed them. You know, the foolish, the only thing which can heal them is the word of truth. In their blindness, they chose to believe foolishness. And the only thing which can you know, deliver them from their blindness and their foolishness is the word of God, which will reveal to them what is the truth. What is the thing which is actually liberating? You know, what can grant them freedom? So God sends his word to the foolish if they will only be willing to respond and he will heal them of their blindness so that they can, you know, be delivered and they can now live in um, freedom, in redemption. In the same way, uh, the people who are overwhelmed by the storms of life, you know, they do not even know how to come out of the crisis that they are in to such people it says in psalm 107 verses 27 and 28 it says uh, they reeled and staggered like drunkards they were at their wits end then they cried out to the lord in their trouble and he brought them out of their distress so um, even people in such circumstances like these they too are called upon to rejoice in the Lord, uh, you know, in these in this last section of uh, praise psalms, because the Lord is even there for such people. Okay, so these are the five types of psalms that we see five uh, in these five sections of the book of Psalms. Now, due to lack of time, uh, you know, we will very quickly move into the book of 
proverbs. Now, the proverbs, as we all know, are basically these short statements that are very, very easy to remember. Uh, for, in, for instance, uh, Proverbs 27, verse 17, it says, iron sharpens iron, you know, just as uh, one person sharpens another. It's very easy to remember. Just as iron sharpens iron, so a person sharpens another. Now, um, the thing about the first principle to remember regarding these short statements, regarding these proverbs, is that because a proverb is so short, it does not provide us with all the details regarding that particular subject, you know, which, which it's touching upon very, very briefly. So to use this very example, which we took now, Proverbs 27, verse 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. It is true. You know, when you, when, when you have two persons um, who are friends with each other, each will be able to see the defects in the other and help them overcome those defects. So they are able to sharpen each other. But it's not necessary that, you know, all the people that we associate with will be able to sharpen us. Because you know you have another another proverb, Proverbs twenty three verse nine, where it says, "Do not speak to fools, for they will scorn your prudent words." So there are certain people who will not sharpen you, and you will not be able to sharpen them. Uh, uh, like it says over here in Proverbs twenty three nine, there are people who are fools, and so because they of their foolishness, you will not be able to sharpen them. And um, they too will not be able to benefit you in any way. So the first principle to remember regarding the proverbs, these short statements, which are so easy to remember, they because they are very brief, they do not convey to us all the details regarding that particular subject. OK, so um, you can only accept a proverb to a certain extent. Yes, a person can sharpen another, but there can be so many other uh, clauses, you know, which don't quite meet that criteria. So principle one, because a proverb is a very short statement, it cannot convey all the details. The second principle to remember when we are dealing with proverbs, most proverbs are generalizations. They are usually true, but it's not necessary that they will always be true in all circumstances. OK, principle two, most proverbs are generalizations. They are usually true, but it's not necessary that they will be true in all circumstances. To use an example, Proverbs 17.6, it says, children's children are a crown to the aged, you know, when we look at our children, when we look at our grandchildren, they they are like a crown on our heads. They are they are our glory. You know, we brought them up, and now they are walking in the ways of God. And uh, when people look at them, they praise them. And so these children are like a treasure. They are like the crown that we are wearing. So it's a true saying, but is it always true in all circumstances? Not necessarily, right? Because I mean, there are children who do not bring glory to their parents, um, like you have in Proverbs seventeen twenty one. Uh, it says over there, "To have a fool for a child brings grief. There is no joy for the parent of a godless fool." So yes, in most cases, children can be the crown of their parents, but if the child is a Fool and grows up into a person you know who, who is not interested in the ways of God, then there is no joy at all for that parent. That child will not be a crown you know, to his parent. So most proverbs are generalizations. They are usually true, but you cannot say that, uh, that the proverb will apply to everyone in all circumstances. To use another example, um, Proverbs 26, verses 4 to 5. Um, 
if you were to you know turn in your bibles to proverbs 26 4 to 5 it looks like as if there's a contradiction over there okay proverbs 26 verse 4 it says do not answer a fool according to his folly or you yourself will be just like him but then in the very next verse it says answer a fool according to his folly or he will be wise in his own eyes so in verse 4 we are being told don't answer a fool in verse 5 we are we are being told no definitely you should answer a fool so what are we to follow are we supposed to follow verse 4 or are we supposed to follow verse 5 so you see um both the verses cannot be applied in the same situation so that leads us to principle number three principle three when it comes to proverbs is that a proverb has to be applied and practiced according to the context on certain occasions i think it would be wise and good for us to answer a fool you know uh, when he when he comes up with these foolish arguments because otherwise he'll think that he's very very wise he'll be very puffed up with pride so it is good to answer him and cut him down to size you know so that he will realize that what he's speaking is nonsense but there may be other occasions when speaking to a fool will not yield any results. So in such a case, you would just be wasting your time and you would be a fool in trying to reason with him. So depending on the context, depending on the situation, certain uh, proverbs would need to be applied, you know, and certain proverbs probably would not work in a particular situation. So principle number three to remember when we are, you know, um, looking at proverbs, a proverb must be applied and practiced based on the context. You can't take a, a, any proverb and apply it to any situation, you know, at random. It would result in uh, problems. Proverbs 25 verse 11. This is what it says. It says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and settings of silver it's talking about how you know if a proverb is used in the in a in a, in a correct manner it, it it is so beautiful it's like a golden apple set inside a decorative trimming of silver it is that perfect if you know that particular word is spoken at the correct time uh, or, or you know to the correct person so when the context is right and you apply a proverb uh, in the correct context it can yield much um, you know value the results may be really really good on the other hand we are told in proverbs 26 9 that if you use the wrong proverb in the wrong context it is very very dangerous proverbs 26 9 it says like a thorn bush in a drunkard's hand is a proverb in the mouth of a fool a fool who does not know which proverb to use when which proverb to apply on which uh, on which occasion he uses the proverbs like a thorn bush you know um, in a drunkard's hand if you put a if you put a thorn bush in a drunkard's hand he'll end up harming himself and he will harm others so a proverb used in a wrong context can actually harm people and this leads us into principle number 4 you know where i will explain this better principle 4 which says some proverbs only make observations they are not offering advice you know some proverbs which are written they are they are being written as an observation of what is observed in society these proverbs are not actually meant to be taken as advice to be followed they are just observations which are being made by the writer so um we will look at two examples of that first example would be proverbs 19 verse 4 where it says wealth attracts many friends but even the closest friend of the poor person deserts them okay it says here wealth attracts many friends now this is an observation which is being made people who are wealthy automatically they attract a lot of friends and when, it, when a person is poor 
even their friends also tend to desert them. This is a general observation which is being made. We are not being given advice saying, you know, with your wealth, purchase friends. We are not being told, with your wealth, buy friends. So how would you use this uh, proverb in the correct context? How would you avoid using it in the wrong context? So to understand how to use a proverb in the correct context, you would also have to look at what is being said in other proverbs which are touching upon the same subject. So principle five is basically this, to accurately understand the teaching contained in a proverb, you should line it up with other proverbs which are touching upon the same subject. What do some other proverbs say regarding this whole matter of friendship? Proverbs 17:17 17, 17, it says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. In the same way, Proverbs 18:24 it says, One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Now, if you take these two proverbs and compare it to that earlier proverb, you know, which talked about wealth attracting friends and poverty driving away friends, the overall lesson which you gather is this. If you buy friends with your wealth, it will be like those unreliable friends who will soon come to ruin. You know, on the other hand, a true friend, even in a time of poverty, even in a time of adversity, it, stay, it says he will stick closer than a brother. So we look at proverbs and we see in what way they can be applied in context, you know, rather than using uh, the wrong context. So um, this brings us to the next principle. I'm sorry, I'm just kind of having to rush through because, you know, due to lack of time. Uh, but um, the learning is this. A proverb um, is not always a promise. Okay, so uh, Proverbs 12 verse 11. It says, those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies have no sense. So here the promise, it's not really a promise because, you know, it sounds like a promise. It says those who work their land will have abundant food. But what about if it is a year of famine? If it is a year of famine, even those who work hard may not get a, you know, a, a crop in that particular year. So not all proverbs are promises. Uh, on the other hand, there are some proverbs which are absolute truths. So when we look at this book of Proverbs, we can take certain Proverbs and claim them as absolute truths. Which are those Proverbs? They are the Proverbs which talk about God's unchanging character. For instance, Proverbs 16, verses 4 to 5, it says over there, the Lord works out everything to its proper end, even the wicked for a day of disaster. So any Proverb which talks about God's unchanging character, he will bring justice. Justice may be delayed. The rich may flourish. But in the end, in eternity, God will punish the wicked. So Proverbs which talk about God's unchanging character, we can accept them as absolute truths. Second, any proverb which talks about God's sovereignty, we can accept it as an absolute truth. For example, Proverbs 19.21. It says, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. And this is true, you know. Whatever the context, this will always remain true because God's purposes will always prevail. So um, just to very quickly summarize, many proverbs are generalizations. They can uh, you know, prove true in one context. They may not uh, prove true in another context. So. When we are looking at proverbs, we look at a group of proverbs which talk about one particular subject and then take a learning from it, you know, rather than isolating one single proverb and trying to apply it, because then we may end up applying it in the wrong way and it will end up harming us and harming others. Uh, 
but there are some proverbs which can be accepted as absolute truths and these are the proverbs which talk about god's unchanging character and god's sovereignty um uh, we kind of rushed through this because there was not much time but you know these are this this these are some of the principles that we can keep in mind when we are looking at the different proverbs all right i think we've actually run out of time so let's just very quickly close with a word of prayer lord we did not have much time to look at the psalms and the proverbs so lord but now we have a greater awareness of the different types of psalms which are available in the different sections and also the different kinds of proverbs which are available in the book of proverbs so now oh lord when we spend personal time meditating on these two books of your word we pray that you would bring out these learnings to us so oh lord thank you lord in jesus name amen thank you thank you so much yes